Okay, so let's go. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Hi, good morning. Usually I don't like to speak on, on mornings, but since I'm based in Germany, um, I like to travel this way because it makes a 30 hour stay and I'm actually awake, <laughs> which is good because I spent uh, most of last night writing these slides. I'm still heavily working on this. Uh, this meaning I'm trying to port NetBSD onto this phone. I'm not the first guy to, to do this, but first let's say who I am. Um, so I'm Pierre Poncherry, as I mentioned, I'm based in Germany. I'm a freelance. I've been working on operating system development as a hobby for many years now, about 10 years. And I'm a NetBSD developer as of May last year, so it's been a little more than like a year now. Um, so <coughs> first I'm going to say why I'm doing this, because um, there's a lot of history behind it, lots of different reasons. Um, and uh, I happen to have the Nokia N900 here. Uh, I got it uh, a few years ago. I'm going to explain how. It's kind of a funny story. Um, I'm going to tell a bit about ARM, the ARM architecture because this phone runs an, an ARM processor and NetBSD was already running on ARM before I started working on this. I'm going to tell a bit about the NetBSD port in particular. Of course, uh, this this work that I'm doing here is not exactly trivial. So I'm, I faced a number of challenges. And by the time I submitted my talk and hadn't really get started with this work, I was hoping I would be able to give a phone call with this hardware. Unfortunately, it's not the case. But I have still quite a few things to say. I'm going, of course, to mention how the, uh, how I, where I am right now with this work and what I want to run on this phone, uh, the Yoko Hours project, which is the result of my um, work as a hobbyist you know, uh, about operating system development. And I'm going to speak a bit about how I see the future, what I want to work on after, after this talk. All right, but first, uh, a lot of things happened for uh, in the last yeah, 13, 15 years. So a first friend gave me a Linux CD back in 1999 when I was still uh, 18. Um, my computer was not really happy with Linux, so I got a FreeBSD CD shipped uh, from the US because at the time I didn't even have DSL at home. I had only an old uh, PSPN modem. Um, although FreeBSD was looking good, I stuck I sticked with Linux for a while. Then I played with OpenBSD on some Surface hardware. Then a friend of mine got a Zorus PDM. Uh, it was a small device. I have a picture after these two slides that was uh, yeah, for embedded had a retractable screen which could pivot and the device could become a tablet. Um, in the meantime, I switched my desktop and laptop environment to NetBSD. I bought myself a Zorus PDA as well. I tried OpenBSD on this Zorus PDA. It was working very, very slow, but working at the time. So then my ex-work friend got invited to a backend. I was playing with this Zorus during her talk. One of the backend attenders saw me doing this. I began to work after that uh, on a different OS desktop. I got some of it to work on the Zorus on OpenBSD. Uh, I attended the CCC camp near Berlin. It uh, was 2007, I think. That was during my birthday. My ex girlfriend offered me an open Moco phone, which was an open uh, hardware phone. I ported the Diffra OS desktop to the open Moco phone, so this is not the first phone that I'm working on. The backup attender happened to be at the CCC camp too, and he was head of a, he is still head of a hosting company in France. And as a, as part of his research and development initiative, we began to sell the Open Coffee Runner, and we sold Europe wide. We created a Linux distribution to support it, which was Debian based, because at the time there was the hardware, but none of the software solutions were really satisfying to to us, and we had to support it. So we decided to take Debian and improve it. OpenMoco was end of life after that. I uh, split ways with Berserk, who was reselling this device. Another friend gave me some Spark 64 boxes. I got a lot more involved with NetBSD doing this because I was trying to run my desktop on Spark. And so I ported my Deeper OS desktop on Spark, on NetBSD. Then Nokia invited me to join a developer event where they gave me an N900, this device here, which is not exactly a phone, but can be used as a phone. Um, the backup attender pointed me to a contest. The contest was about creating an open, to, uh, a open source software-based tablet. So I took my software again, ported it, adapted it to the tablet environment. I co-won the contest this way. I uh, shared the prize with another guy who was doing Android stuff. Uh, 
yet another friend put a NetBSD on the 900, and he's the reason why I'm here. Uh, after giving a talk about the WIFAP tablet, which is the one uh, with which I co-won this contest, I promised to work on this phone next. I applied to BSD CAN, and I had basically nothing working at the time. I tested maple syrup for the first time in Canada two days ago, and here I am in front of you. Yeah, and <laughs> I need some water. <laughs> I love it. I'm going to get a keg when I get back. I hope you're going to let me go the, to the airport with this. I'm going to have it in the airplane with me. Cherish it. Great. So I can, yeah, then it, I will make sure that I have that with me on the plane because I want to use it. Yeah, that would be a shame. Yeah. It's funny. Usually it's a liter over there. And here maybe it's a local liter. What is the equivalent? <laughs> I'm sort of sugar, I did say anyway. But yeah, so this is the Rorus uh, PDA. So I had been, uh, OpenBSD was ported on this, and I ported my software on OpenBSD on this at the time, a few years back. This is the OpenMoco Freerunner. Um, it was developed by uh, an offspring of <coughs> Tick, which was a Taiwanese, uh, which is a Taiwanese manufacturer. Usually they do main boards and consumer electronics or for other companies. And they had this research uh, group started uh, as a spin-off, and uh, OpenMoco was therefore developed as an open as an open hardware solution, and was running Linux, everything open source, the hardware included. Um, you can still find it online if you want, but yeah, it's a bit outdated now as a hardware. This is the WeTab. Uh, okay, it's not really great here on the on the slide, black and black, but. I am I'm sorry I didn't bring it uh, this time. Uh, you can watch my virtual NetBSD talk, which I gave at EuroBSDCon, where I presented this uh, a bit longer. Uh, this is D4OS. Well, this is just a logo. That's I'm just teasing you now. I'm going to show a bit more of it in a few slides. All right, this is the 900, which you can also see here in my hand. So it has a quite big screen, keyboard, which is great for debugging, uh, USB ports, three cameras, um, it does 3G. Um, it's the one, two, three, fourth device in this series, the N series of Nokia, I mean the N series tablet of, uh, of Nokia, but the first one to have a GSM chip. It's based on OMAP, which is an ARM socket system on a chip uh, integrated solution, ARM based, has a reasonably fast processor, quite a bit of RAM, especially by the time for an embedded platform. It was released late 2009. Um, the touchscreen is single touch, but other than that, it's pretty modern. Lots and lots of connectivity, Bluetooth, GPS, GSM, FM receiver, transmitter. Um, as I mentioned, it was 3G. And it shipped with native Linux already when it was released. Uh, Memo was based on Debian GNU Linux. Here I use the past because Memo is pretty much dead, <coughs> unfortunately. Um, so this is a hybrid tablet telephony platform. Um, it switched from DTK Plus for user, user interface to Qt with the 900. Most components are open source, though. Um, there is a good community around the project, which is still alive, uh, even if Nokia gave up uh, supporting it. I think now there is an independent um, uh, company or group taking care of the project, so it was migrated uh, to a new platform. But the wiki still exists, and a lot of documentation and so on. Um, so it died because of some debatable political decisions at Nokia, where they partnered for a while with Intel. Intel had Moblin, Nokia had Memo, it became Migo, but Intel was doing its thing and Nokia was doing its thing, and in the end, um, didn't really turn out really well. So this is the, the outcome of it. It was the one and only Migo phone publicly released and available. And it was really Memo with some compatibility layer to be able to claim it was Migo. So really, it's still Debian-based. Uh, and so on, whereas Migo supposedly supports only RPM, which is kind of poor, but yeah, it's dead anyway. Now it's Tizen and something else. But there is a new company called Jola, which was created by some ex Nokia employees, which is working on a new phone and uh, is continuing the Migo development their own way. So you can watch online our two presentations on how it should look like. and. They expect, I think they expect to launch next month or so in China. But anyway, what's good for us now is that there was lots of documentation available. 
a working code for almost everything. It's pretty hell, but still something to read to in order to try to understand how to get all of this working. So it looks like this when it was released. Uh, so very well integrated, to-do list, calendar, uh, telephony. It, it's connected to Exchange. So it was already a bit Windows oriented at the time. Um, lots of applications, very easy to customize and so on. Um, so now let's get a little bit more uh, into details. If you don't know much about ARM, I believe you mostly don't know about ARM, but anyway, it looks very much like a regular PC inside. So you get a CPU, some DDR RAM, some storage space. There are some buses, it's not PCI, but it's sort of the same. There is user input, lots of interfaces, connectors, 3D acceleration for graphics, video acceleration. Uh, however, there are additional constraints. It's a mobile device, which means it has to be autonomous. So there is a battery. You have strong constraints on voltage, uh, frequencies, how long it's going to run if you uh, suck the CPU a bit too much. Of course, physical size is a constraint also here. It has to fit your pocket. However, nothing prevents running BSD on it, except maybe in the future for secure boot, which is the new way to boot devices uh, coming up with UEFI and so on. And whereas on x86, secure boot still allows you to boot whichever system you want, you can disable it. On ARM, it's not the case. So it's pretty much, now it's, it's going to be a pretty secure platform. And all of the new devices shipping with Windows 8, or most of them, supposedly you cannot jailbreak them and run your own OS. I'm sure people will figure it out, but it's getting more and more difficult with this new hardware. So I prefer not to invest in this and work on my own chip. So a very short introduction to the ARM processor itself. It's risk-based. There is no 64-bit version, but usually you will find it in 32 bits and in Little Endian, although it supports also Big Endian. Um, the company ARM doesn't manufacture any processor themselves. They license the design to bigger companies like Samsung or uh, Texas Instruments and so on. Um, there are lots of different gener generations. Uh, this company has been around for many years, maybe sorry or something like that, I don't remember. Uh, and as a consequence, there are as many different ARM platforms as there are combinations of processor design generations and um, instances of like boards and, and chipsets. So it's not really just one coherent platform or sort of coherent like x86. You cannot run just any ARM code on any ARM processor. It's uh, just not meant this way. So it's a bit particular. And then about the OMAP solution in particular, um, so it, it's based around a general purpose ARM core, which is completed by lots of different coprocessors and extension chips. It was popularized in the open source world, world by the Beagle board, which uh, is based around the third generation of the OMA processor, 3530. And it's uh, luckily very similar to what's inside the 900. It has different names, 3430. But really, it's the same chip inside. It's just that the packaging is different because I guess they had to, uh, they needed a different version of the core for smaller constraints, different physical format, and so on. So the Beagle board looks like this. Uh, you have the main processor here, lots of connectors, uh, companion chips here. I guess one of them is the power companion, which actually has lots uh, supports a lot uh, more uh, connectors because the OMA processor doesn't do much in itself uh, as in terms of user input and so on. It just exposes buses, basically. Um, so yeah, there is RAM. I mean, everything fits in a small uh, board, which is maybe six centimeters wide with three inches. That's 750 or something like that, seven centimeters. OK, so main CPU has interrupt lines, like you would have on x86. The buses are not PCI or ISA or whatever. They are I2C, SPI, GPIO, and so on. GPIO, in particular, means general purpose input-output, which means it's just a bunch of pins, and you can use them whatever you, uh, way you want. They can be input pins or output pins when you input or output data, or you can abuse them as interrupt pins, where you just listen to whatever is happening, and the chipset knows about this, and you tell it to wake you up when some event is happening, either when the pin is low or when it's high, meaning like one or zero, basically, or when it's changing state. 
which means then uh, that it's edge triggered. So the level triggered is when it's a given level, it wakes you up, low or high. Uh, edge triggered is when it's going from low to high or high to low. This, this is going to be very important when developing this. So you have, after the OMAP processor, a companion processor typically interrupting inside the OMAP CPU. So it has a special line, special connection to the CPU on the GCB. Uh, so it's, uh, however, connected on a separate bus. And you have lots of additional processors doing each of the different functionalities that you're going to require, like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or you name it. It's just um, lots and lots of device of different processors. And typically, they interrupt via GPIO pins, which means they are connected to the main processor over the GPIO bus. Sorry if I'm very fast here. I have a lot to cover. J just tell me if there is anything you want to um, me to, to emphasize on. Uh, just as a reminder, this is the old NetBSD toaster, which was also ARM-based. So it was just a regular toaster, which was expanded with some uh, embedded board running NetBSD. And uh, it was fully operational using uh, the NetBSD system. All right, so NetBSD EVB ARM is the actual port that I'm using for doing this. It means evaluation board. Typically, companies like SS Instruments and, and others uh, develop uh, typical designs uh, uh, for people to, to um, grasp the platform and experiment and prototype before shipping an actual product. And this is pretty much what the Beagle board is. And this port explicitly supports, aims at supporting as many of such prototype boards as, as possible. And JSON Corp, SOAP is the maintainer of this board. All right. So if you look at how many kernel configuration files are available right now inside this port, you have quite a few boards which are supported. Some of them are maybe familiar to you, like the Panda board or the Raspberry Pi. Um, the 900 is here. You have the BeagleBone, the BeagleBoard XM, the Plain BeagleBoard, and a bunch of others. They are not all OMAP, uh, of course. There are lots of different designs from Samsung, from more TI, the toaster is there, uh, and, and so on. So NetBSD, why is it a cool platform and why is it found on so many uh, devices? It's typical because it's clean, so it's portable, and it's portable, so it has to be clean, which is uh, really a nice way to um, abstract the system. And it means there are lots of uh, constraints in the way all of the drivers are organized, and the way the system is, is organized and, and what you have to deal with, therefore, when you work on this. So bus access is abstracted, typically. You use the same interface to talk on different buses. Um, the same APIs are used as much as possible across different architectures, which means you can typically only expose what's supported by all of them. And so specificities are kind of tricky to, um, to get by in some cases, especially if you want to write generic code was a problem in my case. So the device stream model in particular, you have a virtual root device, which is just a way on which to attach the real physical buses. Then devices attach on buses. They have exactly one parent node, so it's really just like a tree. And in turn, these devices may expose more, more buses and have more the other devices attaching to them and so on. Um, that's what you see in the message when you boot the system. Unlike Linux, which is just a big loop. On NetBSD, it's really telling you, okay, this device attaches to which bus, going to this other device, going to the root node. And with all of that, devices typically register, register sorry, on interrupt, interrupt lines, and they handle them. And that's, that's pretty much all they do. Uh, interrupt. Uh, it's a very important notion here. Uh, typically, whatever happens on a device, there is an interrupt for it. Typically, when you touch the screen, there's going to be an interrupt telling the processor, OK, there was an event, handle it now. Interrupts are expensive because they are directly, uh, you can only have as many as you have CPU cycles. And they occur all the time because whatever happens, a clock, uh, tick, uh, watchdog, an alarm, user interfacing, packets on the network, it's all going to be interrupt. So you have to handle them as fast as possible with, therefore, as little code as possible. And it's forbidden to sleep and be lazy while handling an interrupt. Because the longer you sleep, the more interrupts you lose. 
because when you handle one, you cannot handle others. So typically, you just defer work. You set a flag or whatever and uh, queue some, some job to be, to be done. And then you're back to regular mode, and the scheduler is going to do your job. So t for this, you have different mechanisms. One of them is the work queue. But then you have also software interrupts or yeah, a bunch of other stuff. I uh, should have listed them here, maybe, but next time. So as a consequence, I had to write dozens of writers because there are lots of different of different devices, especially on a smartphone when you have to handle audio, USB, touchscreen, keyboard, uh, all of the network interfaces, and so on. Of course, this represents a lot of different interrupts. Not enough. Um, I mean, there are too many for the main processor. Um, and as I mentioned, I mentioned separate buses. The, the interrupts are on GPIO, which is a, uh, one bus. And devices are usually on I2C, on FPI, on different buses. And in NetBSD, NetBSD, you can only attach to one bus. So it's really tricky to address this model. Uh, the bad news is, yes, it's, it's, it's tricky. However, there are mechanisms to address that, which are actually pretty good. Just I didn't know about them when I started. Um, and it took me a while. So yes, let's get on with it. So let's prepare. Let's make sure the Nokia 900 boots on a micro SD card. So typically, what you do when you work on this, you open the phone. Like the stylus is a great tool to do that. But you have to be gentle, because you have to do it all the time. So when it opens, you have the battery here and so on. You can remove it. And the micro SD slot is here which is pretty good because you can remove the card, put it on your laptop, and uh, test whatever you have. It's however very, however very slow. And it requires some modifications to the phone in the first place. You have to switch it to developer mode with the regular firmware flashing tool. I think the wiki page for this disappeared or is not no longer reachable from the migration of Memo from the Nokia platform to the new one. But there is another page called Memo Flasher, which sort of covers it. You have to run this flasher tool, check the flags, and uh, be very careful there. So it would be good to find the cache for this old page and put it online again. Basically, you have to flash the bootloader to uh, enable multi-boot so that it boots no longer just on flash but on your card, optionally. And you have to set the phone inside developer mode because otherwise some watchdogs are not addressed and the phone just reboots after like 10 seconds which is a pain when you don't have, don't have enough time to boot and see whatever is happening, and then the phone reboots. Yeah, so the alternative is to film it. <laughs> but, yeah. So the question is if there is some emulation platform uh, a way to emulate the hardware and test it on, on emulation, right? Um, there is a special QMU fork uh, aimed at emulating the Beagle board, which was also uh, extended a bit for the 900. However, the code is very difficult to compile outside of Unix. I managed to do that. Then I managed to emulate a Beagle board bootloader. And for this, you had to I had to create a fake flash uh, file. However, for some reason, it refused my flash file uh, because it checked some other thing or something. And I followed some weird instructions from a Chinese guy somewhere on Google code, whatever, because it was the only place where I found this um, readily available. Typically, other than that, the only thing you can do is take an existing MIGO image, which, which is going to be like four gigs, and you have to start from there. Or, yeah, for the flash, it's a bit smaller, but I didn't want to start from some complex system. I wanted to start from scratch. And so it's, it's really tricky. Um, you have to run Linux or spend a lot of time compiling it. And uh, then I wasn't able to actually get NetBSD to run on this. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. But <laughs> not OMAP 3 yet. But yes, we're getting there. Um, so, yes, be very careful. And if you can, use emulation. However, emulation is not always 100% like the hardware. So sometimes you have 
something working in emulation and not the hardware or the other way around. And then it's another um, challenge altogether to figure out what is really right and how you should address everything. So yeah, it's never a 100% solution. So if you want to boot the 900 and microSD, you need to set up partitions like this. Um, inside the MBR, you want your NetBSD partition to be the first one. The third one has to be a DOS FAT on which you put a UImage file and the boot loader is going to load it and start the kernel. And then it's up to your kernel to find whatever it has to boot. Um, so good news is you can use FFS uh, and create it this way. Uh, you can just unfile the different sets, uh, run makedev in slash dev, which is going to help the booting faster. Uh, the FS tab looks like this. Then you set the rc.conf to be configured. You can even enable ECM here. And if things are all right, it's going to boot X all the way through. You have to be very patient right now, but it's, I guess it is also going to be worked on. There are, we know s uh, already why some things are very slow. Uh, so yes, it's, it's slow. It's a tedious test procedure that I already mentioned. You have no network boots. You have no serial line interface on this phone. Actually, there is one, but it's low voltage. And even if you use a regular consumer um, uh, USB serial adapters for low voltage, it's still too high for this phone, and you're going to free to um, yeah to to break it. Um, so we know where the serial uh, uh, connections are, but they are a bit tricky to connect to. And I don't want to solder on my phone. They are under the battery cover and there are like 20 of them and you have to pick the right ones. I don't remember what the rest is. Maybe JTAG, I'm not even sure. So yes, uh, another tricky part is that initially I had no keyboard, keyboard support. So I could not even go into the debugger and type in stuff. I, I had to update the microSD card every time and boot it again. Yeah, yeah that's a very, very slow process. Uh, on top of that, the documentation is extensive, which is good, but it means the data sheet for the main processor is over 3,000 pages. You don't need to read all of this, but if you want to understand what's going on, you're going to have to read a lot and read it again and again and again. Uh, the companionship for keyboard support is another 1,000 pages. So the way I worked on this is I really forced myself to do one change at a time and test every time and try to remember, write down note inside the code, what was working, what wasn't, in combination with what, and then, yeah, not get stuck on one given bug because sometimes you don't understand enough of the platform to understand what's going on, and so if you lose hours on this, it's just, it's just lost. Often you just switch to something else and understand something about the first thing while doing this other thing, then you come back to the first one, test, and go back and forth, at least it, it worked for me. So anyway, uh, the first step was to differentiate the platform with the BeagleBoard. Because even if they are very similar platforms, the BeagleBoard has a serial line and you don't. And it doesn't have a screen and you do. So the first thing was to uh, change the BeagleBoard initialization code to enable the screen and disable the serial line for the console. Otherwise, you just had a black screen, which is um, useless. Uh, so I have introduced the kernel option OMAP34 30 for this, which is not the cleanest way to do this, but for now it works because it's the only platform that has this chipset at the moment, and we're gonna have to find another mechanism if we ever have more devices this way. So that's, that's minor, really. Challenge two, I mentioned uh, GPIO. Many sensors just attach on GPIO and tell you, okay, I'm a button, when I'm low, it means I'm pressed. When I'm high, it means I'm not pressed, no release. Uh, meaning they are edge triggered. <coughs> they change state, and you just want to know when they change state, and you report it. Unfortunately, it took me a while to figure out that the OMAP GPIO bus driver supported edge interrupts, but only rising or falling, low from to high or high to low. <coughs> so I just had to add these two lines to add support for this. And then I could not only see buttons being pushed, but also being released. And it's also this way for many sensors. Uh, like when you insert an audio plug inside the jack here, it's also on GPIO. Yes? Sorry, how do you distinguish between what's an interrupt and what's data? You, it's 
hard coded. Basically, you know this device is going to be on SPPIO pin, and you know uh, it's going to be interrupting, or that this its data can be abused slash interrupt. Or you can tell, OK, I'm always going to output data here, or I'm always going to input data here. So in a way, interrupts are just inputs. But you react automatically on this input. I think the way it's done, uh, yes. So either your data is just one bit, in which case it, it's, it doesn't matter, because just at the time where you need the data, you check if it's high or low, and then it's zero or one. Or you're using multiple GPIO pins. In this case, you can transfer a word at a time. And you have another, team which another pin, which is working as interrupt, which is telling you, OK, read now, read now, read now, read now. And it's pretty much what happens in a regular bus. Okay, maybe this is confusing. What I meant to say, uh, yes, so say you have a button and you press it. It's an input pin because when it's pressed, it's going to return one and when it's released, it's going to return zero. And you abuse it as an interrupt. Really, it's input and you react when this input changes. You tell the processor, okay, monitor this pin and wake me up when there is a change. Yes. That's right. Yeah. So it, it doesn't say get at zero for a particular piece of data. It just says give this piece of data. Yeah. Well enough that you can get your level of service in time to read what the state pin score is so that you can then know whether it's up or down in the rest of the system. However, sometimes it gets really hairy and people implement I2C over GPIO, which is really, really slow. But in some cases, you want this. Because your platform doesn't have an I2C bus and you want to talk to some I2C device. So some devices only come bundled this way. And so you have to do this. We support this in NetBSD, by the way. We have a server for it. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> but in my case, I, go, I need to handle I2C devices which interrupt, which is the next challenge. Now it gets interesting. Because of course, you can only attach to one bus. so you attached to the I2C bus. But then this I2C device is going to tell you, OK, I, I'm the keyboard here. And I want you to read me now, because the user just pressed the key. And yeah, so how is this happening? Well, GPIO pins are mapped are as interrupts. It's, it's not specific to, to ARM or uh, as a whole. It's only a few ARM uh, platforms which are implemented this way. I don't know if it's just a NetBSD thing or some kind of official thing for a, a given platform. But typically on ARM, interrupts are, are integers. You have the system ones which go from like 0 to 31 or something like this. And then uh, there you have your own convention and you start virtual interrupts from typically GPIO buses on starting on an another number altogether. So here, in our case, we have the OMAP GPIO bus driver, which is found on this internal uh, bus at this address for accessing registers and checking the status of the bus and everything. It takes this much amount of memory to uh, address the registers. And it's going to interrupt starting at 96. And this one has 32 pins. So from 96 to 96 plus 31, you have um, virtual interrupts. And you really will catch interrupts coming from GPIO while hooking the same way as you would with the main CPU. So this is really practical. And it means you can um, handle interrupts from different buses using GPIO lines. And it's transparent. Because it's just a number. It's the same interface. You establish the interrupt. You will register, register it. And then you can handle it. So there is generic code in NetBSD for this, which is uh, called pit code. Uh, I don't know why. I guess it's very similar to 
what microcontrollers do. Yeah, okay. Programmable interrupt controller. Yes, makes sense. All right, so this way you can easily uh, handle interrupt while having a device on the bus which typically doesn't. But in practice, this breaks portability because it means in I2C and SPI code, you will try to hook interrupts. But these devices may exist on different platforms where interrupts are not integers. They are something else. Or there are no interrupts available for these devices in the first place. So it's typically machine dependent. This call is different on each and every architecture, or you cannot assume it's going to be the same. So I proposed a patch at some point, adding an interrupt locator to these buses, but it was rejected, and this was a right decision because it's just not the right way to handle this. Um, it's not portable. So I created my own branch called Corbin 900, where I have committed uh, this, the, this version of the code that I wrote. And inside the main tree, I committed stuff with hard-coded values because there was no way I could obtain these values from the kernel configuration file, which would be a much cleaner way of doing things. Uh, in Linux, it's all hard-coded inside the, the code also, inside uh, the code specific to each and every different board. So you don't have a single file where you can just tweak things and have a working kernel directly. You need specific code for each and every one of the platforms, the ARM platforms. All right. So for the keypad in particular, it was very, very tricky because the keypad is on the companion chip. The companion chip is on I2C. It interrupts on the main CPU because it's a special device which is located in line on the main CPU. Talking to the I2C bus requires sleeping because you send data and you wait for the answer. But you're not allowed to sleep in interrupt context. So typically, you just want to defer the handler. You tell the scheduler to wake you up when uh, it's available to handle the interrupt. But the, the interrupt is not handled in the first place, which means it's just coming back to you repeatedly. And your sh the scheduler is never giving you the chance to address it, which means you need to disable the interrupt while you handle it and re-enable it again. And so far, in NetBSD for ARM at least, it was impossible to do this. It was assumed that devices would just register an interrupt and never disable it, just handle them all the time. And in this case, it's not possible. So I have implemented this. I had to modify the PIC code to allow, for, to allow for this in a way that's affecting much more hardware than just this one. So I couldn't commit it directly. I have to check all of the other drivers, see if they um, return the value that I expect or not. Uh, why did I mention it here? Yes. So typically, well, in practice, the companionship, companionship, it gets even worse. It's connected to five different addresses on two different I2C buses, meaning the keypad registers are reachable on one given address, not on the others, but the interrupt uh, handling address is on a separate place. So what I do is my main interrupt handler is deferring first handler, returning zero to abuse whatever was done before and telling disable the interrupt. It's, it's not handled yet. This first handler uses a global handler to wake the keyboard driver at this other address, and it schedules another handler, again, at lower priority. Okay, so this intermediate handler reports the key pressed by accessing the, right, uh, the bus at the right address. And then the other handler that's running at lower priority, very important, re-enables the interrupt because otherwise you don't get your key press and you lose it and you get back to step one. And yeah, this took me a while to figure out and um, with lots of booting and black screens because this code happens before the initialization of the frame buffer. <laughs> and if it keeps interrupting all the time, it never goes further and you just wait. Is it going to pop up again? Uh, please. <laughs> well, I figured this out pretty quickly, and I found another way. I was abusing other interrupts, so I wrote a specific driver for just deferring this much and and waking up the other driver to do the all of this initialization stuff once the frame buffer was started. 
so typically I was booting and there was an interrupt for the touch screen and I was just pressing on the screen and then my keyboard code was starting and I saw how it crashed. And then I was asking on IoT, how can I solve this? <laughs> and thankfully I got an answer usually pretty fast. So thanks guys. So are you actually removing your handles for storage for the pending or are you just masking the memory? So uh, what the pick code does is uh, it keeps a list of whatever is being handled and then it uh, uh, masks it again for the next time. Which means if you disable uh, the interrupt using a separate call that I added during interrupt context, it's going to be re-enabled anyway. Because after you disable the interrupt, this uh, pick code is listing whatever you did, and then it, it's enabling interrupts again. Uh, so it means I have to really patch deep down the pick code for this. Because even if I was adding code to disable and tell the processor to stop masking it, I mean, to, I don't even remember which one is mask or unmask. Uh, you tell the processor to stop waking you up when there is an interrupt. But when it's done, when the pick code was done handling every interrupt, it was just re-enabling all of the ones it had just handled. So yeah, this didn't work, and I had to abuse the return value of the interrupt handler to tell the pick code don't re-enable this one. And this works. But I cannot commit it directly, so. What if you use the memory for the time step? Yeah. What if there's this new rule of the pick and the pick code that helps you not start handling that interrupt again until the bottom half of the list is is done? I have no idea how to do this. Um, <laughs> so you, usually when you have an interrupt that stays a period beyond the Yes. Um, so that the rest of the interrupt messages are just stale, and then when you wake up, the bottom half. But when it's on a, a and just unmask it. in the case of the keyboard, the re the register to tell the device to stop interrupting was on a separate bus. Right, but you could if you're abusing the TKO doesn't to to say I have an interrupt on this, you could mask it as a TKO. Not and set that up in here because it was interrupting on the, on the main CPU line. <laughs> okay. Yeah, feel my pain. <laughs> well, I got past this now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and initially, I was assuming it would, so I was trying this, and like, okay, what's I, going I on? Never mind. Never mind. No, it's fine. It's fine. It took me two months. <laughs> I can see how I will do that, but <coughs> it's. <laughs> Sorry? It's, it's uh, time to stop? Well, there's, there's like half an hour before my clock begins to fail. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I need to use five minutes. Like uh, five yeah, minutes. yeah, I think so. Because uh, I have quite a bit. I'm going to go even faster. <laughs> um, so, yes, another thing I added recently is a speed locator to make sure that uh, we no longer assume the lowest clock speed available. But because like on Linux, the I2C bus is running for the keypad, uh, keypad part at least, at 2 megahertz, 200 kilohertz. We assume 100 kilohertz because it's the lowest, safest setting there is. And which means when I type a key, I have to wait one second before I can type another one. Yeah, so we need a way to, de to specify that each device is allowed to run faster. But different devices, <coughs> can go only as fast as they can, and so you need a way to tell this per device on a given bus. Um, and yeah, the keypad, keypad driver is not complete yet, but at least it works well enough for debugging and logging in and, and stuff. Um, so there were minor issues. One of them is that I don't have a driver for charging the battery, so I have to charge it every now and then, otherwise it dra drains out. Uh, some calls are not documented to not be uh, allowed in interrupt context, like this one key switch, which I got to know only yesterday. Otherwise, it was crashing just seconds after I was done booting. So I was like, yeah, no. <laughs> okay, what's wrong? 
and of course it was rebooting. So I had to film the device frame by frame, and <laughs> thankfully it was giving me a full trace back before rebooting, so I could figure out, hey, uh, do you know how to address this? Oh, check out this code. Uh, oh, I need a task queue, and there is a call for this. Awesome. I should modify the manual page. Uh, and I currently need a crash course, crash course on SPI because I'm writing the SPI bus driver, but I have issues. And I realized stuff only two days ago. Like I think you have to read as much as you transmit mm -hmm. before you actually read. Yeah, it took me a while. I didn't know. I was reading one through the diagrams, which say electrically what happens and how it's shifting I stuff. Yeah. That's awful. And it's it's that last one. Yeah. Well, in, in the case of OMAP, it says there is a, a register sw uh, shift. And I was like, where is the shift register? But actually, no, it's just that the, the register is the data that's online. And then it's shifted to the receive buffer before you can actually receive anything. So yeah. And first, I was reading the Marvel code, and it was doing this. But I was like, this is so wrong. And it's like, actually, no, it was actually. It was like exactly what I had to do, and yeah, just didn't. So yes, as I mentioned, I'm trying to get as much as possible in the main uh, tree. I'm using Git for convenience to not spam people with commits that are half working. So it's on GitHub right now. Uh, I, c I created a specific branch 10 days ago. Uh, this is not very easy to read, so I'm sorry. But basically, the OMAP plane, uh, the, the OMAP CPU support, and main buses are mostly there. Uh, this is the companion chip. I got quite a few bits working. Some of it was already working before I started working on this, uh, like the watchdog LED, which I couldn't test, uh, RTC clock, and so on. There is also USB on this chip, and audio, and another GPIO bus, which I implemented but couldn't test. And yeah, some more, which I didn't even list here. It's massive. And all of this is over at I2C with the same mechanism that I explained for the keypad. So it's going to uh, be implemented this way also. These are some generic sensors, like the camera cover when you slide it uh, open and, uh, and close, uh, the camera focus button, uh, the audio jack, the lock button, and so on. The keypad slide is also on GPIO when you open and close. So I implemented all of this, and it's working for the most part. I2C devices, there is. A battery monitoring device, which I didn't implement. Same for the headphone amplifier, the audio. I implemented the accelerometer, but right now it's interrupting too often, and I have to, to calibrate it. Um, the I implemented the beginning of the backlight support, but it's not there yet. I have just the temperature meter, great. Uh, light sensor is also on there to handle the backlight. You, you know how much light is coming in, and you know how much light you have to give back for, for the user to, make, to face this kind of situation uh, with low contrast. The panel controller is on SPI. I, didn't, I don't support it yet. The touchscreen driver is on SPI. I, am, I almost have it working, but I have this issue with the bus driver. It was tricky to know what was wrong between my touchscreen driver or my bus driver. It's a bit like the emulation versus hardware problem. You don't know which part is wrong, and then you have to just assume stuff and try them out. Wi-Fi is also on this chip, so obviously it will, re it will require DMA to be fast and efficient. So SPI is not so fast. Um, other devices, which I have to figure out where they are and uh, how, I mean, I have the data sheets for most of these, except for GPS, GSM, and maybe some camera. So there is the LED torch for taking pictures, the both cameras, front and back, uh, Bluetooth and so on, which is still left to be done. Uh, however, right now, I have the system booting multi-user, and it starts X. And we don't have the time to show it boot all the way through, but I, c I just took a video moments ago, and I can show it to you right now. During Eric's talk, I'm sorry, Eric, if I wasn't listening closely, but I wanted to show this to you guys. So this is uh, booting multi-user here. This is just the last bits of the kernel part. I think it's WSConf, and it's Focusing again, yeah, a bit better now. And right there, it's starting XPM. 
it's a bit slow. It, it has started poorly in a couple of the uh, services. Here, initially, I thought it was crashing. But no, you just have, just have to wait longer. 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 Oh, it's black. Something is happening. Wow, OK. What's going on? Longer. Oh, some gray and NetBSD logo on the right side. Vic closing to close to victory. And oops, sorry. And so yes, it's going to focus a bit more. And we have XDM running with XConsole popping up. And you can try to log in. The key map is wrong at that point. But yeah, <laughs> next step. OK, so the touch screen doesn't work yet, which is a bummer. Uh, but hopefully soon. Uh, quick quote on D4OS. The user learned part of it. This is the desktop running on a tablet device, the WeTab that I mentioned earlier with the telephony uh, support, because it also has a GSM chip inside. So I can send SMSs and so on, and say which is the operator. And as I was warning, because I took this during EuroBSDCon in Poland, and I'm back in Germany. Uh, virtual keyboard, a bunch of applications available. Uh, this is when running simulated on a phone. With, with a zoo, which is nicely putting an extra skin around a screen, which is uh, running Vito or Xnest with the right resolution. And then you can test your user and applications with a regular screen size and make it finger friendly and stuff. This should be big enough for my finger. And so on. Uh, this is an old screenshot. I, I improved quite a bit since then. But you have icons on the desktop to emulate like the home screen. And usually I use Matchbox, even if I have a few bugs with it, and so on. This is D4OS on a real phone, on the OpenMoco. Well, I had performance issues, so it looks ugly. With no, gra no gradients, nothing. Just uh, gray, white, and black. Uh, but it was working as a proper phone, even giving phone calls with full audio support and everything. Could even suspend, resume, um, spare battery, and so on. But this was on Linux, where a lot of work was already done, but yeah, I have to do the same for NetBSD now. Uh, booting NetBSD, I just showed it. Um, and it goes all the way there. So the future, uh, get rid of these not implemented um, comments in my tables, in the Java support uh, slides. Get as much as possible inside NetBSD proper. Try to polish things for seven. This is going to be difficult. Or maybe it's going to be much better for the BSD 8 or whenever. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. I'm going to, of course, keep working on D4OS on, uh, at the same time, try to support more devices, including my regular phone, the N9, which is pretty much the same hardware, actually. So that's kind of neat. And there is documentation on how to flash it. So yeah, when I maybe I'm going to just buy another one still possible to acquire it on, on eBay. Um, so yeah, thanks to all of you for listening. Uh, thanks to these people in particular and companies for making this possible. And I hope we all learned something today. Uh, if not, there are lots of other talks after mine. And if you want to reach me, feel free. OK, uh, LibreOffice is really bad at handling styles, as you can see. Uh, but yeah. Maybe I could select all of that. It's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, LibreOffice. OK. Let's cheat. Voila. Uh, huge. It should be big enough. Very important. And big? Big? No. OK. Yes. So that's it for me. And see you soon. And people get to work on them when the hardware is under flash, because then they stop using it as the da regular daily stuff. Yeah. And that's what I did. Did, yeah. did, did, did a lot of the um, uh, uh, expertise in doing this sort of thing with the code base go to the developer and you do manage the front end, you spend like two or three years with the code base front end. Yeah. Have, you, have you managed to form any other relationships where you might be able to get stuff a little bit earlier in the, in the development cycle? Uh, not exactly, because I have a day job. 
even if I would gladly do some consultancy work and, and work on this, I I like my job, <laughs> so it's I also like this, so it's kind of tricky. Um, however, yes, I would like to have access to more devices earlier and to work on this, to be able to work on this earlier, and this would be great, of course. Um, yeah, feel free to reach me if there is anything, if you know of hardware where you have access to it, where sufficient documentation is available already. And yeah, sure. Um, also, um, I wanted to mention also, I'm not the first one to port NetBSD to a phone. I think uh, on YouTube you can find videos of people putting NetBSD on some Windows CE devices. You're running ARM also, HPC ARM, and maybe some more. Uh, but of course it's also obsolete hardware. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. But they don't have JSON chips, do they? Huh? They, do, they don't have JSON chips. No, they don't. Yeah. yeah. And JSON is going to be another uh, puzzle because there is no documentation, I guess, for the baseband. And yeah, it's going to be tricky to support telephony as well. But we could use soft phones as a first step over Wi Fi, which would be yeah, already something. I haven't, and I don't want to do this, because right now what saves Android from my consideration is that it's GPL, and so they have to play by the rules. And if we begin to support BSD on uh, Android on BSD, maybe they're going to switch to BSD, and then we will have no say in the matter anymore, no access to source code or anything like that. Well, if there is GPL, then sorry, if Android is not GPL, if yeah. it's BSD like sometimes you can get this case and sometimes you can't. Yeah. For the most part, being part of Linux, sometimes you can. So yeah. I have a bad experience with Android too because I was trying it out just to see how it goes on some um, device that was not running it originally, some Windows CE device. So I booted a community-based distribution which had ported it very nicely, everything worked perfect, including the Google account, which means Google has complete control over a phone that it didn't sell, uh, contribute to, uh, it's not the operator, it's not the hardware manufacturer. And when I wanted to uh, download an application myself, faking the phone on the main Google portal, it installed it on the phone directly. So I was surprised and I checked what was going on because I couldn't be the first to possibly see this. And in Google I.O., Google said, okay, now you can manage your phone from the browser. And people were like, yeah, woohoo, but it's 1994 all over the place because you give control and everybody running Android basically gives control to this company, even if they run a community-based distribution. It's really difficult, the FSF did it, to, yeah. Anymore. Yeah. But I really don't like the situation. I mean, if you're aware of it, and you accept it for yourself, perfectly fine. But I do not, for one thing, and I think many users do not know the possible consequences of running Android, because this private company in the States has control over everything that's running on your phone, and that's, that's a fact. So, yeah. But that's, that's why I'm doing all of this.